Okay, perfect. So session one today, starting kicking off with our book study, How Learning Happens, February 3rd, 2024. Um, briefly introduce ourselves here. So we are going to be the facilitators for the next six sessions. My name is Nidhi Sashteva, um, <clears throat> and I am a recent graduate from um, the doctoral degree from OEZ. I did my uh, degree in education and uh, curriculum and pedagogy with a focus on micro learning and cognitive science. Um, how learning happens, the cognitive aspect of it is very, very dear to me. So I'm really, really involved in that. I'm also an educational technology researcher and educational technology um, um, specialist and a mom to three young kids. So they have been sent out to their Taekwondo class so I can be with you all. So it's great to have you. Jim. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's really wonderful to meet you. My name is Jim Hewitt. I'm a professor at the uh, at OISE, that's the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto. And uh, <clears throat> I'm the head of our online teaching and learning field. My research focuses primarily on educational technology, but I, I specialize in distance education. I'm particularly interested in collaborative learning environments, and I built an online learning environment called Pepper, which uh, Nidhi and I use and other instructors use to offer some of our courses at, at OISE. I, uh, uh, along with Nidhi, actually, I teach several, several courses that focus on the science of learning um, we like to team teach these courses together because we're, we're both very interested in, in large scale educational studies and what they can tell us about effective teaching and learning. And so, um, yeah, so we're, we're very excited to be here and, and thank you for having us. So moving along, um, <clears throat> in today's session, what we're going to try to achieve is, of course, a quick welcome message and about us, which we did. We will briefly talk about the book as well that we have chosen for this book study called How Learning Happens by Paul Kirshner and Carl Hendrick. Um, and within the first session, we're going to talk through the uh, some background, which is information processing model. Just going to get my spotlight going here. Um, we're going to talk through the information processing model here, which is a bit of a background too that helps us understand the content that was in the uh, uh, you know study material for this week. Um, we'll have a quick breakout room activity for us all to un understand some aspects of cognitive load. Um, and then we'll talk about cognitive load theory and what really it means um, in instructional practice. Uh, we'll have a little section as well about uh, what is the difference between an expert and an novice and how they all solve problems. And we'll just leave you off with what's to be done for next week, uh, or ne not next week, but the week after the session number two, where we will engage uh, with the content about prior knowledge and advanced organizers. Okay. Yeah, the, so the book we're reading is terrific. Uh, we've been using it for uh, a number of years now. We'll be reading a bunch of chapters from it. So the book is entitled How Learning Happens, Seminal Works in Educational Psychology and What They Mean in Practice. It's written by Paul Kirshner and Carl Hendrick. Uh, Paul is a um, is a is like a kind of a legendary educational researcher uh, based in Europe. And Carl Hendrick is a um, an English teacher, high school English teacher. Um, and, uh, yeah, we've met both of them. They're both terrific people. This is a great book. It's a really useful resource for any teacher or researcher, and it's, it's won a number of awards. Uh, the book was published in 2020, and we're hoping that we can look at eight or nine of these chapters during the book study and maybe read, uh, a couple, of, a couple of chapters per meeting. The chapters are, are, are somewhat short. And they've organized the book so that each chapter examines a seminal article from educational research that has important practical implications for teachers. So each chapter is written in very plain language, very easy to understand. And we, uh, we think you'll like it and, and we, uh, we hope you enjoy the book. Um, and please, free, please read some of the other chapters that we don't have time to cover because like I said, there's a lot of really good stuff in here. Awesome. So the focus of how learning happens is on the question of how people learn things. So we're hoping through this book study that we're gonna deepen our understanding of two things. First, one of our goals is to understand at a very basic level how the brain works and how new knowledge is stored, how learning happens essentially. And, and second, once we understand the mental processes that, that are involved in learning, uh, It'll be in a, we'll be in a better position to design instruction that support those mental processes. 
So uh, these are the readings and some of the other material that was uh, we think was shared with you ahead of today's session. So our session today is organized around this content. We're going to begin by providing an overview of what some of the key terms and theories mean uh, and how they relate to instructional practice. And uh, even though this is a book study, we're, we're going to occasionally provide you with additional material that, that we feel is going to go very nicely with the selected chapters for this book study to kind of augment it and, uh, and provide you with more contextual information. So here are a couple of quotes from famous educational researchers that kind of capture this idea of studying, of why we want to study how people learn. So um, the first one says, if we don't know how people learn, how, how on earth do we know how to teach? And then John Sweller, who's, who's a famous um, Australian researcher, says, without an understanding of human cognitive architecture, instruction is blind. So a really good analogy is to think of um, a doctor. So to be effective, a doctor has to know how the body works. They have to know all about all the stuff going on inside you, your immune system, your heart, your, your lungs, your kidneys. Uh, doctors need to know these things so they can prescribe effective medications and treatments that will make you healthy. So in the same way, if you want to become an effective teacher, it's good to know about how the mind works. So teachers need to know how their human brain processes and stores new knowledge, because if they know these things, they can create more effective lessons that help students learn. So we're going to begin with a little bit of background. Uh, I, I think the book, um, again, How Learning Happens, terrific book, but it, it assumes that people have a knowledge of the information processing model. And of course, that's not the case for everyone. So we, we just want to start with this just to make sure that everybody understands it. Um, so this is a... Um, this is a very simple model of the information processing model. Um, uh, many of you may be familiar with this from Psych 101. Um, it's very simple. It begins with sensory memory. We receive information through our senses, you know, primarily visual information and auditory information. Uh, before new knowledge can be stored in long-term memory though, it must first pass through and be processed by working memory. So our working memory has a very limited capacity. So back in 1956, um, uh, a researcher named Miller suggested that people can only hold about seven chunks of information in working memory at any one time. And, uh, and some researchers, sort of more modern researchers think that maybe four chunks is probably a more accurate figure. But the important point is that working memory is very, very limited. So if, if, for example, uh, uh, you know, this is, uh, I was told that this is one of the reasons why phone numbers typically have seven digits. Um, but basically it's because if I give you a list of three random numbers, you can probably keep them in your working memory for a little while and, and say them back to me. But if I give you a list of 20 random numbers, it would be really hard to re remember them all. We can, we, we're, you know, we're very limited in what we can retain in our working memories. So if in some ways you can think of working memories as kind of a bottleneck, um, there are limits to the speeds at which students can take in and process new knowledge. So the, the final step involves encoding the new knowledge in working memory the, in our long-term memories. So we do this by connecting the new knowledge that we've just received to knowledge that we already have. And this is what we typically call learning it's, it's about storing new knowledge in long-term memory so that we can access it again at a later date. So this is the uh, very basic model of learning that uh, we'll be studying uh, during this uh, book study. And in particular, we're gonna be looking at how to design instruction that facilitates lear effective learning at each of these three stages. Now, the first thing we wanna talk about is, uh, is the bottleneck, it's working memory. Um, and understanding the, the limitations of working memory is really important because if the learner's working memory becomes swamped with too much information all at one time, it can interfere with learning and it can prevent um, new knowledge from being encoded in long-term memory. And, and, you know, I don't know if you've had this experience, but if your working memory gets swamped, if you feel overwhelmed, it can also be really frustrating. 
So therefore, from an educational perspective, one of the most important roles of the teacher is to ensure that as students are learning, that their working memories are not overloaded. And, and this is the fundamental idea behind what is known as cognitive load theory, uh, which we're gonna be talking about this week. And the, you know, the second chapter of the book here, I believe is take a load off me. Um, and that's what cognitive load theory is very simply. It's about, it's about making sure that, that working memory is not swamped. Uh, care, you know, you've got to take a lot of care to, to assign tasks that don't overwhelm working memory. Okay, so uh, again, just to summarize, this is, this is uh, the information processing model. Um, um, and uh, yeah, we can take it through. Uh, let's go on, uh, Nitty, to the next slide. Okay, I'll switch that. Um, I got caught you in the middle of an animation there. Oh, no problem. No worries. Okay. So, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So, um, oh, uh, I think I, I go back a slide. See if... Oh, okay. Um, this one? Yeah, that's the one I wanted yeah, to show. Yeah. yeah, I was mentioning to, I was mentioning earlier about this uh, this cool article um, by George Miller back in 1956. 56, okay. So this it was called the magical number seven. This kind of started the whole thing off. The magical number seven plus or minus two, um, some limits on our capacity for processing information. Um, yeah, so the, yeah, so this is one of the most highly cited articles in education. Uh, last time I checked, it had over forty one thousand citations, which is huge. Um, like you know, I get really impressed if one of my articles gets over a hundred. I mean, this is this is really this is this is huge. And the takeaway of this article is that humans can't mentally process a lot of new information at once. It's a rather simple fact, and, and it's an intuitive fact, but it does have huge implications for teacher for teaching. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. Uh, cognitive load theory. Okay, um, so as I said, cognitive load theory is, is about making sure you teach in a way that doesn't overload uh, working memory. Uh, next slide. Um, a number of researchers have called this the single most important thing for teachers to know. One of the reasons for this is because there's been a lot of research on different aspects of cognitive load theory. There are, are thousands and thousands of studies that have validated different aspects of cognitive load theory. And um, it, 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 seem, it appears to be one of the most uh, solid and, and well-researched re uh, theories in education. So. Um, we want to take a closer look at it. Uh, we, th uh, we thought we'd begin with uh, just a quick breakout room activity. Um, cognitive load is concerned with all the things that might get crowded into a student's head when they're trying to learn something. So we thought we'd put you into groups and have you discuss amongst yourself some of the times when you felt like you've had excessive cognitive load and have, and have had problems learning. I'll give you just a quick example. Um, um, so when I went through university, I went through uh, University of Waterloo, and I took I had to take in, in like kind of first year calculus and second year calculus, and I would be in these huge lecture halls with like 500 other students, and you know the instructor would be on the board writing down equations and talking and writing down equations, and I would be able to kind of keep track of what the instructor was doing and saying for maybe two minutes or three minutes if I'm lucky. And after that, I just, I, I, I couldn't figure out how he got from equation A to equation B. I, you know, I just kind of got lost. So that's one example time when I've been cognitively overloaded. But there are, you know, I'm sure everybody's got different experiences. And so we thought this would be just a cool time to uh, uh, discuss some of these. So we'll put you into groups. Um, and uh, maybe you can talk for five or 10 minutes and then we'll come back and uh, discuss some of your your experiences and one of the things while you're doing that i just want to mention that think about also this idea of like how did it make you feel so it's one thing to be cognitive overloaded but then there's associated with certain feelings so that's an important aspect because then you can understand that from a student perspective because you were that student as well so just wanted to add that yeah let's do eight andrew thank you okay i believe everybody's back now so thank you everyone uh for taking the time to discuss some of those 
you know, moments of cognitively overloaded uh, situations that you might have experienced as a student. We thought we'll take uh, a couple of those stories. If anybody feels comfortable sharing, you can uh, uh, just raise your hand and we'll take those stories. And for others, uh, you know, just in the best interest of, interest of time, you can type in the chat, but I'll stop sharing one more time just so we can see each other. But does anybody feel comfortable sharing one of their story that they discussed that, you know, really worked with everyone, connected with everyone? the moment of cognitive overload. In our group, we were talking about how we realized that it wasn't just, I was talking about how I'd taken a course in linguistics for like the third time. And finally that third time, it didn't feel like it was just all whizzing past me. It was starting to connect. But what I realized was it wasn't just that I took the same course three times, but that during that sort of span of time, I was taking other courses and studying other things so I was creating sort of other hooks in my mind that it could, that information could connect to. Mm. And we're all sort of starting to realize, well, yeah, it's not just sort of the repeated information, but other things you are learning that that information can connect to. Yeah. And that that first experience can make you feel so incompetent mm. and so lost. But as you build more information it, that that new information can connect to, yeah. that repeated sort of exposure, then you you have things for it to to begin that that new information, old information to connect to in your brain. Yeah. And you feel less lost. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's the power of continuing to acquire more knowledge and having more to connect to. And then it makes more meaning for you, right? For you as a learner. Thank you, Kate. I really appreciate that uh, insight. Does anybody else? Yes, uh, Alexandria. In our group, we um, kind of had a shared connection with what, uh, other folks have said as well, just being in kind of a university course, feeling overwhelmed with the amount of information at the ad there, and kind of to build on what Kate said as well, was I offered that, I, I kind of internalized that, oh, this must be a, a kind of a fault of my own, because if the professor thinks that I should know this information in this way, then I must be falling short. Um, and so kind of projecting that onto students or young learners how over time that could really have such a damaging impact on their sense of self or sense of themselves as a learner. Yeah, yeah. Alexandria, I just got some goosebumps as you were sharing that. And it's this notion, um, it, it is a universal feeling to feel cognitively overloaded in any learning session, any learning setting, especially when it's new information that I don't already possess. And given the age difference, you know, younger learners will feel more, but it almost always naturally, we go to this feeling of the learner blames themselves, right? And then the system eventually does that too. And then the incremental build up the damage is so big, right? Um, and, and this is re the reason why we wanted to do this really quick breakout activity, uh, just to remind ourselves that this happens to all of us. And of course, if you're teaching younger learners, uh, you know, I have three young kids and I see it on their faces sometimes too. It just, the build up is really, really dangerous. So it was really to bring us all to this idea that, we all feel this and our learners feel it too, right? And there's things that we can perhaps do about that. So, okay, I'm gonna take us back to our slides. Thank you. And other stories, I always really, really welcome, but I wanna be in the best interest of time just to make sure that we continue through our slides. So feel, feel free to type in the chat as well. So thank you. Okay, so um, yeah, so thanks for that breakout activity and uh, you know discussing a bit of those cognitive load and those really powerful insights that came from Kate and Alexandria. That was amazing. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the um, uh, cognitive load theory. So I'm going to get my spotlight back again. So remember, we were talking about the working memory, right? So cognitive load theory really specifically pertains to the uh, notion of wor working memory. And it, it says uh, within the working memory, we briefly mentioned, you mentioned it earlier, is that working memory is the bottleneck. So the memory uh, system, sensory, it's coming from all parts of, you know, visual and auditory channels. And it ha the ultimate goal is that it goes to our long-term memory, which is sort of that bottom of that, you know, information processing model that we showed you earlier. Now, in between stays this, this bottleneck, right? And then the bottleneck can be impacted by so, so many factors. And uh, John Swaller has talked about the three specific loads that can really overpower it. So he calls them the intrinsic load, extraneous load, and germane load. So let's talk about each of them briefly. So intrinsic load. 
The first one is the intrinsic load. What is intrinsic load? It is the effort associated with learning a specific topic for a given learner. So for example, for Jim, it was linguistics, oh, sorry, calculus. For Kate, it was linguistics. Last night, my daughter was really interested in, uh, she's, she's grade four, but she's brought these algebra questions uh, from grade seven level. And she's like, let's do it. And I could see her face and I was like, that's intrinsic cognitive load because the effort to understand the concept, right? So, um, you know, we, we just talked about the uh, feeling of this notion of feeling overloaded. And that happens when we don't have enough prior knowledge, right? Intrinsic load increases when we have less background knowledge. And Kate mentioned that the more number of courses Kate was taking, the more knowledge was being built up and the complexity naturally felt simple. But that doesn't mean that the content became easier. It just meant that um, Kate needed more background knowledge, right? So that, but if there is a lot of gap in that background knowledge, huge intrinsic load, then the, that prevents us from learning, right? So it, it's it's really, really common. It makes sense for something absolutely new for us to have a high intrinsic load. Um, I'm not really amazing with Excel. So when I have to learn something, Jim often helps me. My intrinsic load is very high, right? So it's, it's absolutely natural. And that's what Sweller says, that working memory is almost always impacted by something that we don't know and we have to know, right? Okay. So moving on. What is extraneous load? Extraneous load refers to any unnecessary load that does not contribute to learning. And it's so common. So for example, extraneous load might occur if the teacher has a very disorganized lesson structure or a very noisy classroom, or if the student has a toothache, or if you didn't have breakfast in the morning or any number of things, right? Think of these things as distractors from learning. So sometimes even too much animation on your slides, on your board uh, can be an, a source of extraneous load. And working memory, I often like to say, it's like a, a, a little child in all of us gets distracted so, so easily, right? Now the third one, it's a really interesting one. It's called germane load. Oh, it's it's interesting to understand. Germane is that generative processing that happens in our brain. Uh, Sweller calls it like the good kind of load. So germane load refers to the work uh, encoding new knowledge in long-term memory. It's the productive load. What that means is that when you're learning something new, so, you know, and the, the instruction is big, being given to you, your brain feels the same, you know, those connections being built. And when you have that moment of, ah, I get it that's the germane load. So it's actually the good kind of load. We want to have more space for germane load in our working memory so that learning can happen, so that encoding, storing of the new knowledge can take place. So now at any time, at any given time, you will have extrinsic, intrinsic load, extraneous load, and germane load. As long as you have, as long as you don't have too much intrinsic and extraneous load, your germane load can actually do the job. So you see, it's kind of like a little balanced here. So germane load is doing that connection that we were talking about. Think of these uh, squares, the maroon or brown squares as our uh, new knowledge, and this blue squares are our old knowledge, and these connections are being built. That is the germane load doing its work because intrinsic and extraneous were maintained in a decent fashion. Now, the problem occurs if the intrinsic load and the extraneous load it are too, too high. So there's not much room remaining for germane load, right? There is no room in the student's working memory for the generative processing to happen, which means new learning cannot take place, right? So the goal for instructors is to reduce the intrinsic load and extraneous cognitive load as much as possible so people can learn things, right? So again, this is a very, very quick review of cognitive load theory. Um, there's a lot of uh, content that we also shared through videos, and if you watch that, that'll make a lot of sense for you as well. But what's really important about cognitive load theory is that we as instructors have to try to make germane load more possible by decreasing these two. And that really has the implications for education or for our instructional practice. So here's some of the implications for cognitive load theory, right? So what can we do? Don't teach too much new material at once. If you have a lot of material to teach, break larger instructional objectives into smaller bite-sized chunks, right? After teaching a chunk, help the learner store the new knowledge in long-term memory. How can you do that? 
through simple exercises in which they practice and apply the knowledge before moving to the next chunk. So I was mentioning my kids are in Taekwondo and my son, who's only six years old, has to learn these pomses. And it's a lot of movement in there and he has to memorize it. So I was telling him, I said, you know, you, you practice, break it down and just do the first four and then do them over and over again. And then you do the next one. So it's the same idea. You break it, I guess, too much will increase the intrinsic load on his working memory and he won't be able to process further information. What else can we do? We can sequence our curriculum logically. So you can define your learning objectives, make sure that prerequisite concepts and skills are taught and mastered in advance of higher level concepts and skills. The order in which you teach is really important. So here's an example. One of the um, online platform, I think that we, Jim and I, I think that does a really good job of sequencing instruction is Khan Academy, for example. So from a curriculum perspective, uh, you know, designing, uh, things that are organized in a logical fashion that makes sense to the learner that keeps their intrinsic load low that can really really help them okay what else can we do we can recognize that not everyone in class uh, will possess the same level of prior knowledge learners who lack prior knowledge may find themselves overloaded and confused we've all been in there we've all been in that situation and we've also seen students who are in that situation just face tells it right so some instructors may decide to assess students' prior knowledge at the beginning of the course using a diagnostic quiz. Alternatively, instructors may wish to start a new instructional unit by providing all learners with a short review lesson that familiarize everyone with the required prerequisite knowledge, right? And it's important to understand the learner's level of prior knowledge. It is a critical thing. The more relevant long-term memory you have, the less load that working memory has to carry because long-term memory throws information back at your uh, sense of meaning making much faster. And it, 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 if you have more knowledge, then the working memory won't actually get too overloaded and it, has, it, it needs to carry a lot less information because you're dependent on your long-term memory. Uh, another thing we can do is we can tie new learning to students' existing knowledge. So it reduces, what it does is that it reduces students' intrinsic load when you help them activate relevant existing knowledge and connect it to the new knowledge. It's like, oh, remember we did this? And automatically it's like a quick memory and that intrinsic load that is now about to come from the new knowledge will decrease a bit. Um, we should also try to minimize extraneous load. And again, remember, this is anything that consume unnecessary mental resources, right? So instructional materials should be clear and easy to navigate um, and easy to read, remove unnecessary content that is not serving the moment of learning or that learning objective that you have identified for your lesson, um, anything anything that might distract or confuse the learner. So lots of GIFs, for example, are not often a good idea in a slide where you're trying to get the learners to focus on what is it that they need to learn. So it's such a simple idea, but it's a mental resource that's gonna be used up to look at that GIF before uh, you are focusing on the actual content. Um, this is really powerful and Swaller talks about it a lot provide worked examples whenever possible. So particularly when engaging students in a multi-step problem solving, math, for example, providing worked examples, a demonstration of how this is done, and then they can apply that when they do that themselves. So providing work examples to students really helps them make sense of the content. It decreases the intrinsic load, and it really makes more room for generative processing or the germane load to happen. Um, we can also talk about uh, the multimedia principle here. So we should try to take advantage of the auditory and visual channels in our working memory. What's really fascinating is that we can process these two at the same time. So humans can simultaneously process both text-based information and image information without increasing cognitive load. So we should take advantage of that. Um, but on the other hand, cognitive load can increase if you overload a single channel. So for example, a learner trying to listen to a speech and read a PowerPoint at the same time uh, with too much text can be very overloading for the text part of the channel. So you want to balance it. Use the visuals as an aid to what the narr narration is going to be in very limited text, for example, on a slide. So this is an example for a PowerPoint slide, but there's so many other different ways we can use multimedia principles. Um, Richard Mayer has done some amazing work. Uh, it, it, I don't think it's a part 
of this particular um, book series or book study session, but we do talk about one of the theories that's called dual coding theory that looks at this idea of um, how we can process information from auditory and visual channels simultaneously. Okay, any quick questions or comments at this time? And hopefully we'll have some time at the end as well, but I, I wasn't following chat, so I'm not sure if I missed anything. Okay, feel free to type in the chat in the questions. So the way Jim and I are doing it, one, one's presenting, the other one can take on the questions. Okay, let's move on. Jim. Oh, okay, yeah. So, um... Uh, so cognitive load theory uh, shows up in a lot of different places, um, um, but but as Nitty says, there are there are two basically two places where we can reduce cognitive load. One is um, in terms of making sure students have the prior knowledge. So this you know relates very much to Kate's point about hooks. If students don't have the hooks for the new knowledge, then they're going to struggle. They're going to have high intrinsic load. The other place is to reduce distractions. So there's been a lot of research on cognitive load in various kinds. And uh, over the past year, there have been uh, well, a whole bunch of articles. I, I, we, Nitty and I wanted to share a few of them with you. The first one is decorated classrooms. And the first time I saw this, I kind of laughed because I thought it was kind of silly, but um, there's actually been a lot of research on this in, um, in the literature. Over the past three or four years, there's been a whole bunch of big studies. So many, Elementary classrooms in Canada and the United States are highly decorated. So we're talking about grades one, two, and three like this. You go into a classroom and there are all these bright colors and charts and posters and children's artwork and so forth. And, and teachers decorate their classrooms like this for a lot of good reasons. You know, they want to create a fun learning space that's it's exciting and stimulating and rich with ideas. But researchers wanted to know whether all these decorations might be a source of of extraneous cognitive load. Uh, are these distracting students from learning if you over decorate your classroom? So they've conducted a bunch of experimental studies on this. And I didn't think actually when I saw these, saw the studies that there would be enough of a distraction to make a difference. But it surprised me. Um, uh, research teams have run controlled experiments on this and they found that children in the highly decorated classrooms made smaller learning gains. They spent more time off task. Um, they and they they did things like they monitored students' eye movements and and so forth. It was it was noticeable, uh, and they also found, and this is perhaps less surprising, that the problem was more severe for autistic children. So um, so that was one set of studies that we thought was really cool. Uh, here are some of the papers that have been published on it. Um, we can share some of these with you if you're interested. Um, another another set of studies, and you know this is very important. But we're in Ontario right now, where this is a big deal. Mobile phones in classrooms. Um, uh, you know, mobile phones are are likely to be distracting if if children pull them out and look at them all the time. And you know, there have been a number of studies on this, and and this has been shown to be the case. So just by themselves, they're a huge source of extraneous load and uh, they limit learning if you're not using them for some kind of educational purpose. There's a bunch of different studies on these. Um, now, one of these studies, let me see. Uh, yeah, this the Ward study. This one, both of them actually. Uh, yeah, well, but the Ward study, it was really cool because uh, you don't have to have the phone on for it to be extraneous load. Just having the phone like nearby, knowing that there's a phone in your backpack on, yeah. on the floor, that was shown to reduce cog uh, the student's cognitive capability um, because the student's mind kept thinking about the phone that was in their backpack. And this took up cognitive space in working memory. So uh, anyways, th th there's a lot of cool studies on this that uh, people might want to uh, check into. Uh, Jim and I have also written about some of these topics, especially like the decorated classroom in our uh, uh, science and learning blog. We'll we'll share the link towards the end of that. Uh, but th there's there's a lot of studies, and what's interesting is that cognitive load shows in so many different shapes, sizes, and form. That's the idea. Okay, 
Um, the, the other point that we wanted to bring up in today's discussion, um, in addition to the information processing model and the uh, cognitive load theory, and just providing you with a bit of an overview, is this notion of uh, novice and expert. So uh, we want to talk about cognitive load. Um, we want to make sort of cognitive load is not the same for an expert, and it's not the same for a novice, because they use what they already know um, to solve problems in very, very different ways, right? And this is why um, experts have access to, this is because I should say, experts have access to knowledge that novices actually lack, right? And this directly relates to a heavier cognitive load for novices who don't have the background knowledge and a lower cognitive intrinsic load, especially for experts who have a lot of background knowledge. And um, and that's the second chapter in the book as well, which talks about take a load off me, uh, this idea of like how experts solve problems and how novices solve problems and cognitive load is a direct uh, sort of connection to that. So what this means for us as teachers also is that the kind of problem solving activities that experts do are not necessarily beneficial for novices. So we that's why it also says that um, a novice is not a little expert, right? So to understand this, you know, let's look at how an expert actually solves problems. So when experts work on a problem, which I'm representing here with these red squares in the working memory, they search their long term memory for um, similar problems they have encountered in the past, right? So their long-term memory over the years has been efficiently organized so that the problems that share structural similarities are grouped together, right? They look through these long-term memories, these schemas that they have for promising solutions, these mental frameworks that they already possess for promising solutions. So for example, in my diagram here, the expert might notice deep similarities between the current problem and this problem over here, for example, and that the expert has already faced in the past, right? Now, and, and then they would work forward from there. This is the idea that an expert solve problems sort of in a forward fashion. This would be the starting point for a thinking for the process of thinking for an expert. And that's what working forward comes from working, you know, going forward from what you already know. So think of a medical doctor who's been practicing for 20 years and has seen thousands of patients, right? A new patient comes in complaining about a mysterious ailment. This triggers something in their mind. And I think I've seen something like this, they'd say. Uh, and that guides their problem solving. One of the important points to understand is that for experts, this automatically decreases the load on their working memory. It's going to be relatively low, right? Because their long-term memory is doing the work. This is something I mentioned earlier is that the long-term memory is not providing, here you go, here you go. And because the load on their working memory is low, now they have the capacity to learn from new problems and encode new knowledge, store new knowledge in their long-term memory much better, much faster, more effectively, because they did not have to overfill this with something else, right? That's how uh, experts would solve a problem. They depend on their long-term memory, which is a very, very powerful system. Working memory is a very delicate, very fragile, very tight system. And experts just really have that access to them, right? But novices. Novices generally don't have that much prior knowledge. So especially for a brand new topic, they probably know nothing about it, right? So they can't really rely on their long-term memory for possible ideas or information. So like my daughter last night, this notion of X, she didn't know how to just, what, what does she already know about this idea to tap into it? So I had to guide her through that process, right? So when they faced with a problem, they engage in what's called means ends analysis. You'll read about that in chapter two and you probably already did. Uh, they really don't know where to start, right? They might not know what knowledge they should be looking for or how to get it. So their working memory is filled up with all sorts of things, right? And then they're trying to engage in this idea of means and analysis. Um, now the term means and analysis, means ends analysis can be a little confusing, but I'll try to explain. It really basically means that the learner considers a bunch of ideas first, and for each one, they ask uh, if the idea will take them any closer to a solution. And if so, they explore that possibility, right? For novices, this automatically increases their cognitive load in their already 
um, you know, worked up working memory, so to say, right? And because the load on working memory is so high, it becomes more difficult to store new memories because that, that passing of the information doesn't happen as effectively, right? So presenting novices with challenging problems is not a particularly efficient way for them to learn new things, right? What they'll do, they'll flounder around looking for answers. And this is the point that Kirshner and Hendrik in their book, in that chapter, are really trying to make. They're saying experts have a much easier time solving problems than novices because experts rely on their extensive long-term memory. Novices just don't have that. They don't possess it. So it becomes even more difficult for them. They try whatever means they can, but in return, they end up making the cognitive load in their working memory really high. And we all discussed briefly what that makes us feel, you know, that feeling of confusion, sometimes even frustrating, and then the culmination of, and then it becomes this idea, I don't know this, right? So let's list now some of the reasons why problem solving is easier for experts than novices. And again, some of these would be very obvious once you look at them. So why problem solving learning can be effective for experts, but not for novices. Experts know more right? They just really don't know more about the specific subject area. It's a very domain specific idea, uh, which is about the specific topic, right? Um, experts have seen many problems before and they can see what's similar and uh, in the new problem and what they already have done. And then they pick up on those schemas, those mental frameworks that they have established in their brain and they use them effectively. This is important. Experts know what they know, but they also have a very good idea of what they don't know. So they also know then how to fill that gap, where to look for that information, because they know what they know, and they also know what they don't know. Um, experts know where they can find resources related to the subject area if they didn't have that knowledge. They, they would also know who the researchers are, which teacher to talk to, how to you know in, learn more about that information. So this morning, again, I always go back to my kids because I have younger kids. My daughter is learning about why, writing a piece about why deforestation should matter to kids. And so she's talking about what she already knows. And I said, well, what do you not know? And so she, she, she instantly said, um, certain points and I said, okay, but I know that she should probably watch some videos about National Geographic and that, but she didn't know that. And so I had to fill that gap. Without that, she was just trying to say the same thing in five different ways, not a bad thing, but how does she build more knowledge? But she doesn't know where to go to. So that's something an expert, for example, or someone who knows more, in this case, me, as an adult person, her parent knows more about it, right? Um, experts also know different strategies for solving problem in their subject area. So they, they're more effective with their strategies. Think chess, you know, if you, if you've been a master chess player, then you just know what to do and you pull from those memory, uh, sort of schemas and play chess so much more better than a, a novice chess player would do. Oh, just trying to find my mouse. So what's the, what's happening really? Experts just have a lot of prior knowledge, and as a result, they are less likely to experience cognitive overload when engaged in discovery learning or problem-based learning or inquiry-based learning, right? And that's really this powerful source. And I'm so glad that next week when we're, or next session when we're talking about it, we're going to be looking at this notion of prior knowledge and what really it does. It, it decreases the intrinsic cognitive load instantly and makes so much room for germane load to take place. Okay. Um, now, novices have prior, little prior knowledge or sometimes no prior knowledge. And as a result, they're more likely to experience cognitive overload when engaged in, let's say, unguided discovery where there's no support, problem-based learning or inquiry learning because they are doing that means ends analysis and saying, is this going to work? Is this going to work? Is this going to work? It's just too taxing, too time consuming, too overloading. And in return, they have a heavy, heavy cognitive load in that process. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, so a lot of what Nidhi's been talking about is 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 particularly relevant to the first chapter. A novice is not a little expert, and and what Kirshner and and Hendrick are concerned about here is this notion that we sometimes have in schools that you know it's more authentic if students do math like a real mathematician, or it's more authentic if students do history like a real historian. 
And what they're saying is, well, that's they can't really do that. And the reason why is because uh, uh, students don't have the extensive long-term memories that real historians and real mathematicians have. So you see when, when experts, like in this graph, learn a new thing. Oh, sorry, go back one. Oh, uh, sorry, sorry, apologies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when experts learn new things, like this new this little red uh, square here, they're generally just adding new new knowledge to an already well developed knowledge structure. So that's what they're doing, and that's fairly easy for them. But when novices learn something new, they have to create entirely new knowledge structures. So they're involved in accommodation. They don't know what they they don't know anything about the field. They don't know how it fits in. They don't even know if this knowledge structure is correct. So it's a lot harder for uh, for novices to engage in those kinds of complex real world problems than experts. And so, so Kirshner and Hendrick are worried that we ask too much of our students sometimes if we engage them in those kinds of projects. Um, so there's um, so what what they propose is that. Um, uh, you, we've got this kind of trajectory where we want students to go from becoming a novice to becoming an expert over time, going from low knowledge to high knowledge, and that we're going to have to teach in different ways over time to support this. So let's go on to the next uh, slide, Nitty. Um, so novices, they don't have much knowledge, so they need to build up domain knowledge. They need, they need to create some structures. They need a lot of structure and guidance they need direct instruction. We have to help them build up a solid knowledge base. And then as they develop competence and they develop a knowledge base, they're in a better position to, um, to do more complex tasks. So as they move towards experts, um, let me see. Yeah, go ahead, another uh, slide. Yeah. And maybe one more. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, as the expert goes up, they, they need a little or less guidance because they have that hard, heavy knowledge base. And so you can do more sophisticated things. You can start engaging them in things like problem-based learning and inquiry-based learning and so forth. So what they're advocating for is a kind of trajectory where we begin by providing students with foundational knowledge they need. And then over time, we gradually engage them in more problem-based learning, inquiry-based learning that they can engage in those activities because they've developed some foundational knowledge. So these are the implications um, from, uh, uh, from the chapters one and two that you read. Novices have limited prior knowledge, so real life problems will often overwhelm their working memories, whereas experts have extensive prior knowledge. And because they have extensive prior knowledge, that prior knowledge offloads the strain on working memory, makes it easier for them to solve real life problems. So what this really means is we teach novices and experts in different ways. Novices learn better um, if we teach them through fairly direct teacher-directed methods. Um, they benefit from more from direct instruction. Whereas as you kind of move up the trajectory towards expert, uh, they start to benefit more from um, more open-ended kinds of inquiry and um, and need less guidance. We can kind of start turning over responsibility to the student. Okay, um, so that's it. I think we're, we're nearing the end of our hour. So uh, we want to talk briefly about our, our next readings. Uh, we're going to go on to uh, chapter six. Uh, what you know determines what you learn. And actually this connects with some of the stuff we've looked at today. You know, how do we make sure students have those hooks in long-term memory to learn new stuff? Uh, and we've got uh, two other, we got a reading and a video, the role of pre-existing knowledge and how knowledge happens to, uh, to accompany the chapter six. Okay, so, um, so before we leave, well, actually we're gonna be here for the next uh, few minutes. If you have any yeah. questions, um, or, or Nidhi and I are really happy that you came today and uh, we hope this was, Kind of a helpful beginning to the to this book uh, as as i said before i think it's a terrific book and you'll really enjoy reading it mm -hmm.